first of all, thank you very much to the program committee for giving me the opportunity of coming here and talking with you guys. Uh, I am sorry I'm not going to present in Russian, uh, but if after you guys want to ask me questions, I am with a couple of Russian friends, so we'll have some Russian compatibility there, right? So I am in the network engineering, uh, infrastructure engineering team at Facebook, and basically our mission is represented by essentially this slide, right? Our objective is to ensure that the service owners don't have any sort of negative impact from the network. This is kind of like the theme that you will see in this presentation as we go along, right? So that's me. <laughs> in case you're wondering about the other three, uh, basically they are, I usually give this presentation with David, but he couldn't come, so I'm, I'm alone. They're part of the team, right? So we're going to be talking about a couple of things. Like the first thing is some numbers about Facebook scale, because I find that it helps people understand, uh, you know, some of the challenges that we have due to the massive size of people that we serve, right? Other, the other one is basically, you know, some infrastructure piece to understand a little bit about how we do the things we do, and this is a little uh, me trolling uh, with the name because this is like a play on words about the whole SDN bonanza we are on, right? Tales from the real world, which is how this actually gets applied into, you know, uh, real situations that all of you, most of you, if not all of you, are going to be able to relate. What are we working on in the future? And of course, Q&A at the very end, right? So let's talk about Facebook scale. So you have some numbers here uh, that are recent as of March of this year. I think that the most interesting two numbers here are essentially like our mobile user, which is 1.5 billion uh, monthly actives, right? And our complete uh, daily active, uh, complete monthly actives, which is 1.6, right? And the most interesting thing about this is that more than 84% of those are outside of the US and Canada, right? So like. What does that mean for the Facebook network? This essentially means lots of traffic and a global footprint, right? And the other pattern that we see is that typically we have two types of traffic, right? We have the traffic that's machine to machine and we have the traffic that's machine to user, right? The traffic that's machine to user, uh, it's typically, you know, it, it continues to grow. It grows as our user base grows, but like it's a problem that's easy to manage or it's a problem that's easier to manage than the machine to machine traffic that enables some of the rich experiences that we provide, right? And, you know, with all this in mind, like we have this, this theme that we repeat a lot inside of Facebook, which is that engineers build robots and robots essentially manage the network, right? So a lot of the tools and a lot of the things I will comment are basically things that came out of engineers, right? There are things that an engineer said, doing this manually or doing this in this way is really inefficient, like we should do something about it, right? So let's talk about some of the pieces that fit into that puzzle, right? So if you look at this diagram, basically this diagram is like a high level overview or a high level diagram that explains how our alarming or monitoring pipeline works, right? So to the left, basically you have sources of truth and essentially to the right, you have consumers of those alarms, right? So to the right, uh, like I said, sources of truth are for example, FBNet, which I'm gonna talk in a little bit, which is you know, essentially like our database, the entire network is modeled inside of FBNet, which means that FBNet knows about everything that we want to, we care about, right? Then we have things like our key value store that we call ODS, and we have things like syslog because that's something that we get for free from network devices, so why not use it, right? Um, and then you have, you know, the things that process those alarms, they eventually end up in Alarm Manager. Don't worry, this will become, this will be uh, uh, more uh, apparent to understand as we go along, right? So, like I said, FBNet, for example, NetNora is our packet loss detection system, and we recently spoke about this in the last uh, edition of Nanog, and we open source some of the components that are used to make this work, and we explain uh, how you can use some of the backends. We have like our own personalized backends, but we explain how you could use some open source projects to achieve similar effects, right? So essentially, you could go and build your own, right? And again, Nanog, we did uh, a session about how you can build your own FBAR, right? Megasort, which is our alarm cor correlation engine, which you know, it's basically correlates alarms. It's not it's too mysterious. Uh, drain services, I really like this icon. It's basically uh, how do we take traffic away from a device? How do we take traffic away from a network element? How would we take traffic away from a line car or a port or et cetera, right? So like these are all parts of the, of the puzzle, right? So let's talk about uh, tales from the real world. Um, so this is how do we apply this, right? So I have a few examples here. I think that for the most part, 
most of you, if not all of you, can relate to this, but let's go through them, right? So circuits at scale is basically how do you manage the complexity of, you know, like typically if you manage your own backbone, it means you have, for example, a data center and a couple of pubs, or you have a data center to data center to simplify. I'm gonna try to keep it to like, you have two data centers, they are interconnected somehow. There's people that do this by having their own private backbone. There's people that do this by basically how, you know, going over the internet with IPsec tunnels and handling that way. Ideally, you would have two or more paths, right? You would have like, for example, if we have two data centers, like at the very least, we would have like something like a north path and we have something like a south path, which are like, you know, two ways of getting out of that data center that don't coincide with each other in any point because if they do, then basically everything's going to fail and it's not good, right? So the problem is that at our scale, we have this everywhere and like most of the time, fiber is not like a single piece of glass that's, you know, for example, if you take something like from Madrid to Moscow, to just two random points in, in, in the globe, right? Like usually it's not a single piece of glass that goes from Madrid and gets to Moscow and, every, and it's managed by the same people. Typically this is stitched together by providers and it's built of, you know, dozens if not more of like small sections that put together this, this link or put together this path, right? So when you have many of these, you will find the situation that we find that every day at every, basically every hour of the day, there's someone doing some maintenance in some segment of some part of one of the paths of the data centers on the pubs, right? So obviously in the beginning, when you had to, you know, obviously you want to take traffic out of that because if that path is carrying 500 gigs or, or more traffic or whatever it's carrying, and you basically, that you lose that and that had production traffic on it, it's gonna be a bad experience for everyone. Your service owners are going to complain, my latency just went through the roof, my application is going insane, I have retransmits, et cetera, et cetera, right? So we have to come up with approach, okay, so we know that this is going to happen because the vendor has been kind enough to say, you know, we're going to do maintenance here, please, you know, do whatever you need to do, but like I am moving this fire and I'm like putting over the bridge and then under the bridge and then again over the bridge and then around a tree and you go like, why? And they go like, because we can, right? So we started this doing this the manual way, right? So the manual way was like, we had a, basically the on call had to look at a, at a particular inbox and they had to like, okay, so I am on call, this is part of my on call responsibility, I have to figure out what's happening, I have to figure out how do I take traffic off of those, I, fig I have to figure out when this event has ended, check that everything is cool, put traffic back on it, awesome, right? Oh, as we grew, this didn't scale, and the on-calls were basically getting really annoyed, so somebody developed a system that did this halfway, right, or at least it was the first version of this. So most of the heavy lifting of figuring out, okay, so how do I take traffic off of this, right, like all of that became automated, and basically the on-call just had like a notification, hey, on-call, this is starting in an hour. You need to push this config list to the devices, sorry. You need to push this config list to the devices, push, and like magic will happen. And the on-calls were doing that. Um, but of course, after, after the initial stage where they got happy about the fact that they, needed, that they didn't need to do that all by hand, they got annoyed again and said, okay, so, you know, like why do I have to do this, right? And that's where we are now, right? So basically, this process is fully automated, right? And it kind of looks a little bit like this, right? Uh, I don't know if you guys can actually read that. Um, so we get a notification from a vendor. This notification gets processed by a parser and the parser essentially understands all of our known vendors and some you know, on their format and sometimes when they change the format, we do like some, okay, I'm going to guess and you know see how good that is, right? That usually ends up badly, but. Um, that gets parsed, it, a task gets created which is our standard ticketing system, we call it tasks. And then we have a system that's called Poltergeist that we use to interact with tasks and that system basically looks at that, checks a bunch of things, uh, does some sanity checks, like for example, is this event going to last 10,000 years? Then like probably this is a mistake and you know, humans should get involved, right? Uh, assuming everything goes well, it calls, it calls those drain services and it, you know, those drain services take over, they basically do a series of checks. If everything is cool, they take traffic off of that, off of that particular link one hour before the event we wait until that event ends, Poltergeist does its magic again, and the drain services essentially put production traffic back into that link after they do a series of sanity checks to ensure that things are how they should be, that the links are actually up, that they're not flapping like crazy, that they don't have hundreds of thousands of errors, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly the same thing a human would do, right? So this is great, and like, some of you might be already thinking, okay, so like this is awesome, this is what happens when, you know, like a vendor is kind enough to tell you they're going to grab the fiber and like put it around a tree and then like bring it down and then put it under the, under the bridge and uh, over the bridge and you're like, why? So, but what about 
when things aren't planned, right? Or what about you know my favorite my favorite um, RCO RCA of all, right? Which is fiber eating sharks, right? So this happens. This happens more than and weirder things like oh this fiber got caught because of uh, you know they were doing live exercise around the area and they blew it up and you're like what? So how do we handle the things that aren't planned, right? So it gets handled by a system um, that basically, like I said before, like typically this is not, we don't think at least at this point, we don't think about links anymore in the terms of like, okay, so I have these two data centers and they're connected by 40 or 100 links. The reality is that they're connected by a path, right? So you have two paths, you have three paths, you have four paths, right? Let's, if we keep up the analogy of like north and uh, south, what usually happens and what the fiber goes down, all the north links go down. And uh, I have 10 minutes, so I have to rush. Uh, I have bad news, so I think we're gonna read wrapping in 10 minutes. Um, so basically, this all of this gets aggregated, right? It gets aggregated by Megasaur to avoid like, oh, you have 100 link events. No, the reality is you just lost one of the fiber paths, right? This goes to a system called vendors that logs this into an operational database. This then FBNet checks, okay, so who owns these links or who can, who is the best person to, or who is the best organization to like, you know, try to identify what the problem is or try to like sort the problem out, right? A task gets created because that's where we keep track of things. Emails get sent or, you know, if there's an API, an API call gets made to that particular provider. They do whatever it is they need to do. They send someone or they send a boat and they fix the fiber, they kill the shark. The links recover, we put them in a, like a monitoring period, which is where like it's an observation period. That monitoring period ends and we close the event, right? And that's two use cases which are sem semi-normal, right? Or like they are typical and you know everybody can relate to that. So now let's talk about one that's a little trickier, right? And this is my favorite graph of all times, right? This is, a, this is essentially a graph of pain, right? Uh, this is a wonderful graph because in a single graph you can see four months of pain and in an entire routing fleet uh, that was carrying a lot, a lot, a lot of traffic, right? So as you might imagine, uh, or as you might deduce, right, like this is essentially the free memory of the active CPU of a large routing platform that we had. And I'm gonna call it active CPU because we promised we weren't, we weren't going to say which vendor it was. And if I actually use the proper vendor terms, you guys would figure it out and like you can, you are all very smart and you can put two and two together and like, you know. So I'm gonna use vague terms. So this is on purpose, so don't troll me in the questions, right? So this essentially, as you can see here, maybe you can't read it, but this starts at the end of October and basically it gets fixed at the, end of January. So this is essentially four months where an entire routing platform was essentially leaking memory like there's no tomorrow, right? And as you can see from this graph, like it will leak memory, something would happen, it would get, it would go back to like what I call T0 and it will continue leaking and this was essentially what happened for four months, right? And this was quite nasty in the sense that what was happening here was that these devices will start leaking memory and it wouldn't be that they will run out of memory because that's what they, you would expect. Like what would happen here is more exotic and more magical. What would happen here is like the devices were around 50% free, free memory and basically what would happen is that they would suddenly go insane. And you would be looking at your graph and it's like, okay, so I see that you have memory leak but like you still have 50% of the memory so why are you going insane? It's going insane because like bad software is bad software, right? So. What would happen is like first you will lose control of the device. So you couldn't SSH, you couldn't telnet, you couldn't console, you couldn't do any of those magical things, right? So like, you know, you would go, okay, that's really annoying. I can't control it. I've lost some of the monitoring. Yeah, that's not good. If you left it in that state after a couple of hours, the device will start doing SMPLS, right? And some of you are wondering what on earth is MPL SMPLS? SMPLS is selective MPLS. It's I am going to do MPLS whenever I feel like it, right? So basically, the problem in a single device became the problem of the entire backbone because you have a single device that's sort of doing MPLS whenever it feels like it, right? Which made the other devices kind of insane because they're like, what? Sorry, I move a lot. They're like, what on earth is happening? And like, fun times, right? So the workaround was really aggressive. It basically involved reloading both of the active, uh, the active and the standby CPUs, right? And it had risk and like, again, the device is in a bad state and you had a very finite time to respond. So if this, like you hit the bad threshold or you hit one of the bad thresholds in, um, you know, Saturday at 2 a.m., you basically had something between, depending on the device, you had something between five hours and eight hours, right? 
So the clock is ticking. If you are sleeping, I don't care. I am going to crash and I'm going to take the backbone with me. So not fun. So like I said, the workaround was quite aggressive. So how would this work? Well, if this was with humans, basically this would become the on-call task and the on-call task would have to like do this every day and they would be miserable for four days or for the duration of their own call and they would be really unhappy and they would be up updating their LinkedIn, right? So how did we actually fix this, right? This should be how, how it was because this is a long fix. But so basically, like I said, we store a lot of information in a key value store that we call ODS. It doesn't matter. It's a database. I query it like, you know, to me, the, the latest, the three latest data points on this particular thing. And it tells me, you know, like where we are. When this went below a particular threshold that we set, where we know we had between 24 hours and 48 hours to respond, this would generate an alarm. This alarm would get consumed by FBAR. FBAR, like I said, is our automated human. And FBAR essentially works by what most organizations call a ROM book. We basically have put in Python, right? So, I mean, like at the end of the day, like a script is essentially a series of order steps where you're expecting a series of inputs and you're going to do some action that will have a predictable output, right? So this, this ROM book concept, we basically do the exact same thing, only it gets put into Python and it gets consumed by a computer, which we call FBAR, right? So FBAR had a remediation on how to handle this situation where we were telling him, you need to expect all of these things, right? So you need to expect a router that's in this state. When you do this show command, you, your, the output should look similar to this, et cetera, et cetera. Basically confirming that the device is actually in that bad state and you need to do this super aggressive thing that you need to do now. So if I will go, if I will check, if I will say like, yes, I agree. And when it said, I agree, basically we'll call the drain services and the drain services would do this, their series of pre-checks and if everything went well, they would drain the device, right? They will take traffic away from the device, right? Now the device doesn't have any traffic and we could apply what the vendor uh, told us to do as a workaround, right? Which again, vague terms, involve reloading the active CPU. This would make the standby CPU take over. When, this, when the active CPU, came back, we would reload this again because you needed to reload everything, right? And when the redundancy recovers and everything is as we expect, we are back into T0, we are back at the top of that graph, and basically FBAR would, you know, do a series of checks and then undrain the device, right? And this is essentially how we survived this situation for four months, right? Like the first couple of times this ran, it, it, you know, it had, its, it had its bugs. I am a terrible, terrible developer. Uh, or programmer or whatever I'm supposed to be called. Um, so like we fixed a couple, the couple, uh, you know, the initial box in the first couple of days and then this did this to a, like that entire routing platform for the next four months until the vendor could actually provide the fix that they needed. They could test it. They could find all the underlying causes that, you know, trigger this in the beginning and actually solve the situation. Which is hilarious because they saw the situation in the active CPU and then we had another, another memory leak in the one that was in standby. But that, didn't have this selective MPLS effect, which we, we care less, right? So that's, those were essentially three examples of how we have used automation to like, you know, as a force multiplier. So to give you a little more context, I'm going to tell, uh, to talk about, you know, like what we do in, in a month uh, with some of these components, right? So emitter processes syslogs, right? And like typically network devices are very chatty. So basically our, our syslog processing engine uh, typically receives something around 3.7 or 3.3 billion logs a month. And we usually don't do anything with 99% of them. Because like I said, network devices are very chatty. They are like, dude, somebody SSH into me. And, like, and I'm like, I don't care, what, why? It's like, go away, right? But then if you miss the one log that's actually telling you, hey dude, like I have a, a fib inconsistency and I'm going to melt, you care about that one, right? So this usually results in 1% 1 uh, 1 alarms, right? FBAR interacts around 750,000 times with our network devices in any given month and resolving around 99.6% of the alarms. This is because most of those alarms are, trans are transient events, right? Like the other 0.4% are either things where the automation was expecting the sky to be blue and the sky was red. So the automation goes like, you know, like the series of conditions aren't there. Human, you are smarter than me, go check, right? or because there are things where FBAR can do very little, like for example, with a core dump. Like with a core dump, at most what we can do, if we deem the core dump to be like a serious event, is drain the device and automatically create the case for the vendor. Carrier maintenance, which is a system that handles the, the first example that I talked about, handles around 300 maintenances in any given month. 
vendors, which handles the fiber eating shark, handles around 1,100 uh, events. And Megasaur aggregates hundreds of thousands into alarms into around 1,200 master alarms that get consumed by automation, right? And this basically gives us the flexibility that as I am speaking now, there's essentially a single on-call in charge of the entire Facebook network, right? And most of the time, that on-call is not even like looking at a monitor, he's basically on page only mode, which means an alarm has to be critical enough to actually send them an SMS or, you know, like automation has to declare, dude, I give up, like, you know, like I am panicking, you come look at this, right? Which is obviously a rare event because on calls don't enjoy getting paged, right? So like whatever page and they go and fix and then this is disappears, right? So what are some of the lessons learned and recommendations that we have for people that are doing this journey? Because a lot of people are looking into this with things like open source things, things like Nippon, things like uh, Ansible, things like you know, some of the other open source projects, I'm, like Sir, for example. So what are some of the lessons learned and recommendations that we have from our experience, right? So lesson number one is reuse existing code and tools when it's possible and when it makes sense, right? So the idea is to be flexible, right? Like, this, this uh, syndrome of you know, not developed here or not invented here you know, can, really, can really limit your ability to react to these events. Like, like I said before, like I am a terrible developer, so most of the time, if I want to do something, there's probably already a, a library that does exactly what I want and it does it better, either internal or external, right? Sometimes that doesn't exist, and when it doesn't exist, like, you know, I get developing, but like, this is something that you have to stay flexible. Same way that, you know, for example, we have doing this networking coding uh, adventure seriously for probably the last four years. So there are systems that were developed four years ago that are still in production and we look at them now and we say like, yeah, we really didn't know how to do this, right? They're still work and we are working on migrating. Right? We're working on going to, you know, like with four years of experience, right? How do we redevelop this, right? Number two is that hacks quickly become important tools. A lot of these tools and a lot of those remediation logics was essentially something that a human did during an event and basically we said like, yes, this makes absolute sense. Now you go back to sleep and let the computers do this all the time if this happens again until we have a permanent fix, right? This ties very well with number three, which is, you know, in order to have a, like a really sustainable uh, code base, you should do these three things, right? Which is instrument, unit test, and document all the things. Why? Because don't even think about, you know, the next person or the next engineer that's going to touch that. Think about yourself. Like sometimes it happens to me when I'm doing what I call code archeology. span when I'm like looking at something I, I wrote three years ago and I go like, what the hell is this doing? Like, what's the input? What's the output? Why is that variable called that, right? Like without documentation or without like, you know, those guidelines, you don't know, right? Like it's the same thing as instrumentation, which also ties back to number four, which is poke for feedback often, right? If people don't like your tool, they won't use it. Like we have a really interesting case where, you know, like we have ways of saying, you know, this network device is under maintenance, that way it gets ignored by everything, it doesn't generate alarms, computers don't try to drain it. It basically is, you know, it disappears from their view, right? Like, but of course, if you don't do that and you're doing a maintenance, unexpected things can happen, right? So we had an incident where someone didn't do that or basically they did it partially. They did one end and they didn't do the other and we went to incident review where we are essentially going through the process of, okay, so why this failed? Why did we end up in this situation? And the person, and I told that person, why didn't you use tool X? Because tool X does all of this for you, right? You get all of this for free. And that person told me like, well, the problem is that tool X is too slow for me, so I do this by hand, right? So I said, okay, that's fine. So have you ever told anyone that tool X is too slow? And he said, no, right? So we, the, we then looked at why it was slow, we made it better. Like for example, we just recently had like our suppression system, which is part of that system that, bl that you know, ensures that no alarms get active when something is under maintenance. There were some scenarios where it was taking three minutes to create a suppression, which in like human time is like, oh my God, three minutes, that's, that's unbearable, right? So, you know, people were not doing it, so we reduced it down to three seconds, right? Which of course, is, it's a massive win, right? Number five, network devices don't have powerful CPUs, right? And this is a really interesting thing because we have, a, a lot of people in my team actually don't come from a networking background but they come from a server background, right? So there are system administrators that are used to, hey dude, I have servers that have, you know, 64 cores. What, are you, what do you mean I cannot get a counter every four seconds? What is this, right? And then if you try to do with a, that with a router, you will melt the router. Like in fact, we had, I mean, this, we had that theory that we had a series of collections that were, you know, killing a series of routers. And we said, okay, let's do like an experiment. Disable them all. And the CPU were from like 98 to 24, right? 
So like, you know, usually routers need CPU to talk with GP and talk MPLS, like, you know, they're not there to be monitored, right? So, you know, this is an interesting one. Number six is the sooner the robots take over, the better. As you saw from our numbers and as you saw from my examples, like this gives you a lot of flexibility. This gives you a lot of, essentially a force multiplier. It allows your engineers to actually work on more inter interesting things and not, you know, completely hate provisioning, completely hate on call and, and, you know, even troubleshooting, right? Number seven is talk is cheap, focus on impact. We are big believers of version one. We are big believers of in imperfect solutions. We are big believers in get something out of the door, even if it's a proof of concept, and iterate over it, right? And this ties very well to the last one, which is done is better than perfect, right? Like, I prefer something that occasionally fails than nothing at all, right? And again, there's lessons. I mean, like, we don't believe in, like, okay, let's whiteboard the perfect solution for six months and then get it out of the door, right, when it's no longer relevant. I prefer something that, you know, it's janky, but it's a step in the right direction, right? So that's what we we're doing. So what are we working on? We're working on um, ensuring that FBOS and our hardware platforms are have feature parity and they're better than even some of the things that we have on the network. We're working, we're doing a lot of work related to controllers. So this is not only PCE in the sense of like typical MPLS, but this is controllers in general. How do we take the brains out of the routers and we do more interesting things because that, give us, that gives us platform flexibility and it allows us to do much more interesting things. Um, Uniting uh, the optical world with the IP world. The optical world tends to be even further behind than the IP world in all of this monitoring and like manageability stuff. Everything tends to be a closed system. Standards seem to be like non-existent. So we are trying to bridge that gap as best as possible. And the last one, which is the one that everybody kind of forgets when they talk about automation, is like the continuous development of, of the tools, right? Like if you have a tool and this tool is not maintained unless your network doesn't change ever, which is not true in any network in the world, you need to keep your tools up to date, right? Because if not, you know, they, they will lose their, uh, their relevance quite quickly, right? So we have a Facebook group that's called Pound Edge Code for network engineers that are making this journey. And there's usually always someone from Facebook uh, around. So like we talk about, you know, like I said before, things like Ansible, things like Napalm, the things that we have open source. So if any of you are in this journey, feel free to join that group. And you know, if you have any questions, ask us there, right? So that's all for me. Thank you very much. And before we go into Q&A, I leave you with one question. Uh, uh, thanks, Jose. And uh, I'd like to see if anybody has questions. Uh, OK, great. So I see one, two. And I think let's, let's start from that side. Hello, Gen uh, is it working? Uh, hello, Gennady Abramov, uh, Link. Gennady Abramov, Lynx Telecommunication. Interesting presentation. So uh, yeah, I, think, I think your mic is off. I can like. Yes, I also think so. Uh, oh. <laughs> so at first, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Some of slides and schemes uh, looks uh, really fantastic. Uh, the future is came. So the question. Uh, were there any, uh, well, uh, remarkable cases uh, when implementing uh, such uh, system uh, of, well, let's say, uh, robots rebel when uh, system uh, behaved uh, by its own uh, with uh, some uh, catastrophic results or uh, so on? Well, let's say to avoid uh, reputation uh, <laughs> losses, you may say it not in Facebook, but in the same company <laughs> with yeah, same I system. Mean, sure, like I'm terrible, right? So like uh, when we, I mean like at one point we decided uh, le let's be aggressive, right? Like at one point we decided let's be aggressive and for example, we have a platform that again, I can't say who it is because like they will cry there. If you're interested, people from that company are in this room. So look at them, if they're blushing, you'll know, you'll know it's them. So we have a platform that basically has so many issues that we essentially said, Okay, so if that device, if any of those devices report anything, right, like anything, we drain them. So it's like, uh, you're drained, right? So like when we started doing that, we made all sorts of mistakes. Like for example, in one of the first things that happened as soon as I put this in production was that we essentially drained two routers in the same pop, right? So we drained the first one and then we drained the other one, which basically disconnected the pop, right? So yeah, but like, I mean, that's the thing, right? Like that happens, you go to incident review, you learn from it, right? And you put safeties in place so that mistake happens once. Or in my case, two or three times, right? But no more, right? 
So that doesn't happen. I mean, that happens a couple of times, and then it doesn't happen ever again, and you live with this happy ever after, right? So it's like break things and move fast, right? Is it yeah. like that? Okay. I'll hand mic to my commentator. Thank you. Two guys, and then I see one more guy. Uh, Victor Bello, Mobile Telesystems. <coughs> uh, do you have any further plans with open source sourcing components you use to manage your network? Yeah, so like the problem with open source, I mean, like we're trying to open source as much as we can. The problem with most of this stuff is that networking always kind of comes behind in the sense of, like, in, like I was saying before, like if you, when I speak with some of the, like the system engineer guys and they're like, why do you have so much problem with these network devices? Like, we've, like servers are easy, right? Like we have like, you know, 100 times more, like what's the problem, right? So a lot of the stuff that we're using is kind of adapted from that world. So like everything is so ingrained into the Facebook infrastructure, right? That's why, for example, with like the Nanox stuff that we did about Packetlobs, we kind of explained, okay, so like we have this thing called ODS. This, if you want to have something similar, you should use this project, right? Because it's complicated. I mean, like it would basically mean open sourcing, you know, it would be pretty impossible, right? So we try to open source as much as we can. So yes, there's plans, right? Like the all FBOS is open source. Cool. Example. Thanks. And uh, one here, and then it's I have uh, another. Denise Shorin, uh, Netcracker Technology. Uh, maybe I uh, missed one um, key point. Uh, you do this for in multi-vendor environment, or you uh, using uh, your own uh, routing platform, and this is automation for your own platform. And uh, if this is multi-vendor environment, uh, how many uh, equipment type uh, uh, this uh, system manage and troubleshoot and so on? Yeah, so yeah, this is, this is multi-vendor, right? So like this is all the vendors that you know and love and our own, right? So yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't know if like if I tell you four, five, six, like it does, I, I can't tell you which vendors they are, so like I don't know if that matters, but all the big ones, right? Like whatever you have in your head, we have it, right? And, it, okay. and it's failed, right? And it's part of that graph that you saw before, so. Cool. Huawei too, right? Huh? Huawei too. I don't know. Just check. Okay, I have. Alexander Lem, one, two, okay. Alexander Lem and Curator Labs, and the question is, first of all, thank you for brilliant presentation. It makes a lot of sense to me personally. Second, it's really nice to see Net DevOps actually happening. It's about time. But the next question is, when something broke with your automation, like, ah, need human assistance, right? And then you fix it, and then you want to replay it to make sure that it works. It's all about profiling. How we gather data from our network and environment to replay it, like, that's the breakpoint. I want to go back this amount of uh, BGP announcements in time and see what happens next. And I don't really want to do that in production. And there is just no tools. Do you have something in store for that? Are you working with vendors to have these facilities in place? Because I think next thing is, I don't really think that we're up uh, to speed with instrumentation in the network world as we are in programmers world. That's a huge downside. So what do you have? Yeah, so um, I, th I mean like, to, simpl to kind of simplify, we're talking things about like having something like BGP Play, right? Or, and, or you know, like some big companies, I, I, I probably shouldn't say their name, like have this thing of like, oh, like I'm keeping snapshots of the control plane and then I can replicate that in a lab type of thing, right? So yeah, we are not, we are not quite there because most of the time, I mean, maybe in a couple of years when everything, if not most of things will be our <coughs> platform, right? And we can like forget about like, hey, Mr. Render, I need you to do this for me, or I need you to fix this for me, or et cetera, et cetera, then it will be easier, right? We are not quite there. But we do have a lot of, we do have a lot of forensic data, right? So like, if I want to know like, what was the state of the MPLS network yesterday, like, that data exists, right? It doesn't mean it's the most fun adventure in the world to try to replicate it, but most issues are quite simple to replicate except one I am going to talk about in RIPE in October, which is going to kill my potential vendor career forever, right? <laughs> because it's, it's great. So I'm gonna leave you guys with that. For Looking right. forward to it. Yes. I like the intrigue, and you know what? Do you think that the control plane is gonna be just in the cloud too, so basically from the dump pipe, you go into the dump device and say, you don't care, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. I'll have one more speaker, and I, I mean, 
question. And I uh, think that's Evgeny Zovnitsov Factor Group, I just wanted to thank you. Yes, uh, thank you for the making automated uh, vendor sh sh pain sharing machine with the vendor. When the correct numbers are appeared, you automatically open the case on the vendor side. And the question comes uh, to be able to uh, understand uh, and correlate the events, you need to understand what the device are, what the profile is, what the topology is. Do you have some kind of method or technique how you model the topology for Yeah, so, I mean, like I said, uh, FBNet, ev the entire network is modeled on FBNet. So the, the theory, right, I mean, of course, we haven't put this to practice, right, but like the theory is that you could go and you could roll out every single device that we have and put new devices, and then with that information, you could rebuild the network, right? So, you know, like one of the first audits that we wrote or one of the first scenarios that we wrote was, um, was, you know, like I had an engineer and the engineer came to me, I was on call and the guy told us like, I, I am missing 16 line cards. And I'm like, what do you mean you're missing 16 line cards? And the guy, yeah, 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 like, you know, like this thing I am deploying, like line card 12 is not there in all of them. And I'm like, what? And according to FBNet, the line card was there. Right? So somebody, that line card got deployed, they got installed, they were working and somebody, you know, since that wasn't in use, somebody took them, right? So we created an audit which is like, you know, FBNet is saying this device should have 12 line cards and the line card number 12 should be this model. Is that, is there, is that actually there, right? So everything is modeled in FBNet. Cool, sorry, uh, we are just a bit like into the next speaker slide. So I'll let you ask something real quick and then we'll pass to the next speaker. Thank you. An answer. Yeah, or we speak? Yeah, you, you please ask. May I speak in Russian? So you have one team. Uh, so does it make sense uh, to, to make two or more teams so to so that there would be competition and uh, and uh, It's very fluid, right? Like, like there's teams and they have like a well-defined mission and all of that. But like typically, people arrange around projects, right? In the sense of, you know, like there is a project to whatever scale the edge, or there's a problem, or there's a, a project to do whatever. So typically, people come together from different teams, and pretty much, I think that the message that I tend to give engineers is that like everything magical that we have, we wrote, right? Like everything. If you want to like have meaningful impact go develop something, right? Like take a problem and make it go away forever with Python, right? So it's, there, there's not a single team doing this, right? Like this is like a global effort, right? So. Cool. Well, I really hate to say that, but I think we are out of time and we have one more speaker coming, which is about 20 minutes for that talk. So yeah, we'll see if we'll have any extra time. I think we can always let you ask this question or you can talk in private. Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. So, um